Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life with Sabine Parza. Hi everybody, this is Sabine Parza with another episode of Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life. I'm here today with Esther Gall. Esther is a dear friend of mine we met over 20 years ago. Esther is a dancer, teacher, performer and organizer who lives in Budapest, Hungary. She's currently teaching at the University of Theatre and Film in Budapest and is a director of the Contact Budapest Studio. Esther was the artistic director of Contact Festival, which was an international improvisation festival that also offered a lot of contact improvisation. Esther has been a long time collaborator with Peter Plyer and is currently dancing in his Berlin-based company Cranky Bodies. She's also a certified Skinner Release Technique teacher. She dances in the Mixed Ability Dance Company Tanzania. She has been an organizer of the international documentation platform iDoc.de and she currently works on her PhD which is uh, focusing on somatic-based movement research. She's also a mother of two children and a very dear friend. Esther and I, we talk about training as a dancer, how to become a professional dancer, how to sustain yourself as a professional dancer over the years. We talk about collaboration. We talk about her training in Arnhem, Holland, and how it had influenced her or how it is still influencing her all these years. And what does it take to balance life and art, even if uh, you are living in a difficult political climate? I share with you my conversation with Esther Gall. Hello, everybody. I'm Sabine Parza, and this is Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art, and life. I am super happy to be here with my very good friend, Esther Gall. Esther and I, we've known each other for a very long time, 15 to 20 years. Um, Esther is a dancer, a teacher, a performer, She works at the University of Theatre and Film in Budapest. She has been the director and founder of the Contact Budapest Festival um, that ran for about 15 years. You can, of course, correct me if that's wrong. She uh, has been teaching uh, and performing in many different places internationally, many international contact festivals, improvisational festivals. You're also currently... Uh, collaborating uh, in Peter Plyer's work. I mean, you've been collaborating for a very long time. It's actually something that I would like to talk to you about. Um, but you're also a collaborator, dancer, performer uh, with the Mixed Ability Dance Group Tanzania. I think you've been with them also for a very long time. Your focus is on somatic-based movement research, and I think you're working on it on a PhD level right now. And you're also a mother of two children. So amazing, amazing uh, uh, f uh, richness that you have uh, lived in your life. And I just want to say hi, Esther. So good to see you. Hi, Sabine. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Oh, so lovely. I remember first meeting you um, at Eastside in 2000, which you hosted and organized in Budapest. Um, I doubt that you remember me because you were busy, busy, busy organizing. But that's when I first met you. For those of you listening, Eastside is the European Contact Improvisation Teachers Exchange, a, um, uh, a conference for contact improvisation teachers. And you were the organizer. And I, from the beginning on, I was so impressed by you. You are just you are just the thing. You are just like, okay, this goes here and this goes there and this goes there. Oh, 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 so something is happening. Oh, something is changing. Okay, so we also change. So then we change this and then we do that and then we do that. <laughs> so this is my earliest memory of you. Uh, you have been one of my heroes, one of my role models in many ways. You are so versatile in what you do. You're a beautiful dancer, beautiful performer, beautiful teacher, but you're also an amazing organizer. And um, I think I copied some of the things that you do. I can <laughs> very honestly say that. Mm. Mm. So, Esther, I really remember, yeah? I really remember Eastside 2000 yeah. because you had a 
I mean, like lots of things happened. But there was a yeah. performance night, and you had a duet with Martin Keogh. And uh, of course, beautiful pictures are are made. And I just remember one when you're rolling on Martin's uh, lap, and he's standing, mm -hmm. and he told me that, yes, yeah, Sabina is going to come because Martin was here before Eastside to teach her workshop. And then mm -hmm. Sabina is going to come, and you're going to meet her and see that she's tiny, but she's lifting me. <laughs> so that she's got, and you will see. And anyway, so I remember your duet with Martin. So I do remember. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, was, the that first was a time very wow. That was the first time we met, and I think later we really became friends. I the the next time I remember meeting you was really at another East Side, interestingly in uh, Haslach in Austria. Yeah. Yeah. That was two two thousand and six, and I think that was the first time we actually had time to talk and to talk about our different backgrounds. I had just been. Uh, I was working at the rehabilitation center at the time and applying my dance to people with uh, severe injuries and severe um, disabilities also or different abilities. And I remember you invited me and you were the first uh, organizer to invite me uh, to a contact festival. You invited me to your uh, festival, yeah. contact, uh, contact, do you call it contact festival? Hungary yeah, or but, what was it? No, we call it, uh, it was an international improvisation festival, but that year, yeah. 2008, was a very special audition because that was uh, Contact Improvisation 36 birthday yeah. year. So we had a satellite project or mm -hmm. satellite uh, event. Performances also, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also the festival was dedicated to Contact that year, 2008. Mm -hmm. But usually it's mm. much broader. But also there was improvisation. But that year was kind of specific uh, about mm. contact. Yeah. So I do have to continue because we continued working after that. You invited me a couple more times to your festival. But also I invited then I you to my know. festival. <laughs> I think you were, the, you were the teacher who were teaching the most. Um, I think three years in a row I invited you. Um, you have been co-teaching with me. We were co-teaching at my advanced teacher's training. We were, we've been performing together. We had different kinds of parallel teaching situations in dif different festivals. And I've come to really um, appreciate you on so many different levels. Um, and I think the main, my main inspiration to you, uh, that, I, that I take from you is, is that you're an improviser no matter what. Like, I remember walking on the beach of Tel Aviv with you, and we were sharing about our life, and we were just walking, and I just had this, always this sense of, we are right here, right in this moment. And to me, that is one of, like, the true qualities of improvisation. And so for, for me, that's really something that... Um, I take from you, yeah. So you're, you're even when we're setting up now, you were putting up the light, and you know, there's. I mean, it's a performance quality also, but I feel like with you, it's, it's so, it's so real. It's not. It, it's just always there. It's a, a presence about you that's always there. So, my dear friend, <laughs> I would love to hear. I would love to hear. Um, what are you busy with at this moment? I would love to hear a little bit about um, your story also, to kind of showcase you also with your story. We've both been around for a long time, yeah. um, and maybe also some future projects. Where do you Where do you see yourself going? Mm. So to begin with, where Where is your first memory? Where do you locate your first memory of improvisation in your life? Do you remember? that you, um, as a child or as a performer or anywhere, like a, mm -hmm. a, a significant moment of improvisation that you can remember? Uh, I try to go back and back and back and back, but I think it's really connected to, to dancing. I think improvisation, like not, not as a child. I think as a child, you know, because, I mean, I was a gymnast and I was really like, you know, studying and kind of planning things and I had to train and whatever. So I, I, I think the first when I, when I met improvisation, I think it does connect to, to dancing, like dance improvisation or, or a bit like with a, with a performance artist who was working more from, from theater background 
He came to us to accompany. I worked with Berger Jula after graduating university. And, and I think that was the first time that, I, that I've done some improvisation. I saw some improvisation that was really, I was really impressed by Eva Kartzog, who came to visit uh, Jula Berger's classes. I was, I was maybe about 17, and I think she did some kind of Tai Chi routine showing us her training with the Trisha Brown Company. And, uh, and then she was doing a bit of a performance, but it was not like, um, it was not only set material, but she brought into like, mm. okay, improvising with it. I think that's when I saw dance improvisation within a- How old like were you a, at the- I think How old was, were you? I, I think I was around 17. I just started dancing mm. a year before, like I was 16 when I finished gymnastics and I started dancing. And then I worked with a company after graduation university, which was like I was 22. And then the company, in the company, we did work with improvisation a little bit. I, I remember being very scared. Oh, my God, what to do? I can't do anything. And, hmm. and, um, and uh, or maybe sooner there was, there was something, but it was not significant. So I think when I really started dancing and focusing on researching, you know, what, what really dance means for me, um, that really just happened when I went to Arnhem. So really mm. when I met improvisation, that it's also a performance art form and it's, I have something to do with it, that was, that was really in Arnhem. Um, Arnhem. But I did have a few experience in Budapest before. Yeah, we'll get to Arnhem because I think it's significant in your story on many different levels. Um, but when you said you started dancing, like you switched from being a gymnast to dancing, what what kind of dancing was that? Was that ballet or modern dance? Or? No, I no, not modern. I started with jazz dance. Mm. Jazz, because that was that was available, and I really loved the floor routine, and I really loved moving. And then one of the trainer we had. Uh, was a jazz dancer and then he was doing these musicals and kind of shows on TV and then he got me to the master, the jazz master in Budapest. His name is Jesenski Andre. And, uh, and then through one of his students, I started jazz dancing. So that was really like, I really had to move and I mm. really loved those movements. And then later on, I studied, you know, all the modern dances, but not in school system, but in, in educational programs, but not, not within schools. Uh, yeah. Because that was and not how available was, in the 80s. Yeah. And how was that, that transition for you from gymnastics to jazz dances? Was that easy? Was that something that just sort of flowed? Oh, that, or? Was, that was liberation. That was liberating mm. me because I love moving really, really, but mm. not like running or, I mean, I loved sports as well because I, I finished the uh, university of physical education. You know, I loved it. But, but I think that just to feel the moving body that was really connected to dancing. And, and, uh, and I was 16 and just loved those movements and that was available. But then I knew I needed more. And then there was this evening education I started, which was a three year program every evening or every other evening and uh, and then I studied lots of kind of different things but it was it was very smooth and and I must say that I had I had the feeling that I found myself you know like out of gymnastics I, I really had enough enough upside down enough enough tricks enough you know strengthening but more feeling my body when I move mm -hmm. and I just really loved it so I found myself home basically at the same time it probably gave you a really good physical basis you probably had some strength or you also had experiences of being upside down that were available to you also later for for doing more acrobatic contact improvisation you you there was some some training some base training that you have that I feel like uh, one of the things I do want to talk to you also about is is how it is for young dancers to become professional dancers now and it's such a predicament that in the one on the one hand, so many of us had rigorous uh, technical training, um, ballet, jazz dance, or gymnastics, which I, by the way, also had not to the same extent as you did. But it still it gave me some sort of muscle tonus or some some body awareness also. Um, but I feel like many dancers now are kind of caught up in this in this uh, predicament of training the body but not not 
going the full ballet route because we already know that that's not that healthy but and and at the same time all that release work is available but then sometimes I also feel like well you have to release from somewhere like you it's just releasing if you don't have enough if you don't have enough strength or if there's not enough uh, structure or or shaping within the body is also quite difficult so I wonder if if you as an educator and then we'll continue with your story, but we'll con like as an educator, if you have a point on that, if like from your own point of view, your early training, if it was helpful for you also then to become a professional dancer and if you would recommend it or not recommend it. Ooh, that's a really, really big issue. I think it's a very vast, vast theme to talk about because I think the diversity of, Dance, dance as an art form, as a performance form, is, is, I don't know if it's more diverse than before, but, but my experience is that now there are so many choices and so many overlaps is who can actually become a dance professional. And, uh, and there are really like lots of things available and information is fast and also bodies are faster, like more sponges. And also like Eva Kartsak talked about that she needed much more time to e explore and experience the somatic work and, and working from ballet when she was also a ballet dancer before working out for herself. And then my generation, which is, comes after Ava, she said that, oh, it's faster for us, but who are coming after us, it's faster for us. And it's, the speed is just one thing. It's not, it's, sometimes it's, we, we st also like talking about speed and time, we have to understand time. I mean, that, that's what I, what I learned through somatic work, that time works for us. But some dance styles or dance performance styles are about, now and fast and producing and blah, blah. But it's very diverse. The field is very diverse. So from my experience, if we go back to like how I become a dance professional, what I had to do is undo, a lot of undo. And on one hand, I'm very happy that after a long, long time, an integration process started to happen. And then things are available. You know, I love doing cartwheels. I love to do jumps. I love to do things that, I'm, that I still can do because I was a gymnast. But it was a hell of a job. And I remember that there were moments when I was like, oh, I, I just want to let go of the past. So I think we all need to come to a place like, what is our interest? What is our interest about the moving body? What is our interest? What is the core source or fuel or what's that word mm -hmm. it's that oh I have it in Hungarian now when yeah from your guts you know you know it you know it I'll say it, in hung say it in Hungarian I want to hear Zigeri. it Zigeri. <laughs> you have this Zigeri feeling that that you ha you have something to do with dancing and then mm -hmm. if you had the gymnastic background you had the ballet background background but you're researching movement you want to have a dialogue with yourself, with your body, with your whole being, because you would like to bring your art manifesting through your body and through your whole self, with your whatever, whatever, thoughts and blah, blah, with your whole self. Then you will find your way. And then if you have to do a lot of undoing of ballet, or I had to do a lot of undoing of gymnastics, that that's what you're going to do. And, yeah. But if you didn't have, and you had a lot of releasing, like one of my students in Arnhem, he loved releasing, and then he said, oh, but it's like, oh, I don't, I don't, it's not, it's not. And then he started to do like, you know, the opposite that I did. So he needed to strengthen, he needed to do training, he needed to go to um, contemporary, modern, jazz, you know, yeah. and because that was his way to find his artist, his art through his physical and whole self into manifesting in a dance performance in dance dance art yeah. Yeah. so i think it's i think important. what you're yeah I, I think what you're talking about is something that i talk very often in my teaching is is that it's neither the cooked noodle that's just flopping around it's neither the collapse nor is it it's super tight 
uh, bored of a body and depending on where you come into any sort of dancing if it's contact improvisation or if it's a more formal uh, way of performing also it, you will need to adjust also and train in either one of the directions and I think you just described that very well it's, uh, yeah but there is also one one thing that we are we are now talking about like who is really a dancer who is a dancer or what like and and who is not so much a personality or an identity it's more about you know i'm going to become a professional and train my body to become this hired body you know that i can do or or all around dancer you know the hired body is an expression i think of susan sontag i think but i, I don't want to make a mistake so but but it's like so you can be in a company and you are using your skills to perform a particular choreography of a particular very specific choreographer that's a diff that's a bit different than and then you have to know a lot, a lot, a lot. And then you have to know a lot, a lot, a lot about yourself if you want to create your own work. If you have a very different aesthetic than Akram Kam or, or Nim van der Kebus or, or whomever, Anna Teresa, you know. And uh, so I think what's really, I think what's really important at the moment, and I'm going to, to say something different from this line of thought, but is to value to value ourselves as a dancer and it doesn't matter like who, who, who what kind of a dancer i'm a dancer who who i really want to be and how i really want to bring myself but i have to find mm. the value if i can be a very good technician and i can be a beautiful performer and a good technician with, with a very specific choreographer mm. and i'm a dance mm. artist and but i have to value i my my work my, my i know so much as a dancer mm. And I'm working for a choreographer. And another dancer says, okay, I'm training in a different way. And I'm going to make my own art through my body. And I become, or whatever, collaborative. And then, I don't know. Yes. It's, it's, maybe I'm a little bit messy, but... No, I think it's great because you're you're showing the complexity of the of the art form. Also, you know, it's it's in many ways it's so it's so much like like many professions. Also, it's not clearly defined in one particular way. If you are a Graham dancer or a Lamon dancer, or yeah, it's not one technique that defines us anymore, and it's not even technique that defines us anymore, which is what you're talking about. So I would like to talk to you about uh, uh, the step that you made when you went to Arnhem. You studied there for many years, and I think what you have told me about it, it was really, it was really like a um, such a such an important time in in your life, but also such an important time in so many other people's lives. I think Steve Paxton was teaching there. You guys had these six weeks, I think, residencies. I mean, so much of the forefront of research was happening at the time. And I'm wondering if how that still influences you, how that time felt, who you met, like what, what was that, like how long did you go there also? And how do you remember that time and how is it still informing your dance? Wow, yes. So it's really great, actually, because it's exactly 30 years ago. <laughs> I went to Arnhem in 91. And um, why I went to Arnhem is because um, I was on stage already. I was a dancer. I was performing with a company and I was teaching. Uh, but I had the feeling that I'm still doing gymnastics. You know, I, didn't, I, didn't have, I, I didn't know what my body was doing. And I, I saw my arms like put placed in places. And I was like, oh, but so I was asking myself, am I a dancer? And what is movement for me? And, and then I just, and just, I found a flyer and, you know, I knew Ava Kartak, who was a teacher in Arnhem. And, and then I was like, yeah, I, my English is not so great. I don't really understand, but I feel, I feel something. I feel something to do with these words, that there is still, something is going to happen. So I had the privilege to go for a two-year program, a privilege because I was the first Hungarian. I didn't have to go for an audition, so I only sent in my bio and some written material. I was the first Hungarian, and they were really, they really didn't know who they are taking. So and that was kind of who they were taking. And Mary Fulkerson, Mary O'Donnell, saw me on the first day of the school. Ah, she looks like on the picture. So she was like, she was like the photo. She, she's like, okay, that was the welcome sentence. So I look like on the photo. 
<laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm in the right place. And the first class, Tony Tetri came in. He opened the door and he was like sliding on the floor and lying on the floor. And I was like, oh my God, where am I? <laughs> it's the place to be. So I was 91 and then I spent three years there. So I extended with another year because I wanted to do project within the school, within the studies. And... Um, and then basically I stayed in Arnhem and then two years after graduation, I started to teach there because the directors knew I was already a teacher. But it was really fantastic because I started teaching just a few workshops, whatever, but somehow I could participate in the classes and I stayed in this realm of researching dance and researching movement and working with um, different uh, teachers after graduation. And I started really to integrate. That's when it really happened. So I spent another seven years in Holland around the school, becoming a staff teacher and but also a regular guest teacher. And I was It sounds like such a luxury the lu that you guys had such a luxury of studying with like one teacher or researching with one choreographer for yeah. such an extended time. I don't think that any school can do that or, or is able to do that. I, maybe there are some but, um, but that and it sounds special yeah. That was yeah. a very special time. The 90s, the early 90s, was something was really cooking. You know, the, the New Yorkers were coming to Amsterdam, and then the school from the uh, School for New Dance Development just reopened a new branch in Arnhem because Mayor Fulkerson, O'Donnell, and Art Huhe had another vision that they couldn't continue in Amsterdam. So they found a school in Arnhem, the theater uh, academy, that was saying, okay, come with your program. And they were really extremely open. They didn't want to control anything, and they financed it greatly. So mm. they could continue to bring the New Yorkers, the American performers, the post, who, who grew up on the postmodern um, uh, uh, thoughts or visions, and uh, the performance art in New York that time was Yoshiko Chuma, Jennifer Monson, um, and the contact uh, second generations like KJ Holmes, Karen Nelson, and then Ismail Houston Jones, and Karen Finley, um, Dance Noise. They were, they were really hot in New York in the 90s, and they were coming to Arnhem and teaching. So there was a very strong movement of, of bringing that performance art uh, into our curriculum and into our study. And I must say that I'm, it's really influenced um, uh, until today, my work. And now I'm working with Peter Plyer in, in his company, the Cranky, uh, Cranky Bodies A Company. He just formed his company uh, last uh, year, and I joined the company. It's kind of a collective, but it's a company. We are very international, and, and we are about 22 people, dancers, musicians, um, designers and uh, and I met Peter and started to work with him actually already in 91 fall he just came back from New York and we did the first uh, improvised little trio and then I, we started to dance together in Arnhem we started to work and later on after graduation we graduated in 94 at the same year in Arnhem we started to make our work and now what we do with Peter we really not only what we learned and studied in Arnhem and what, what what became our material or, or foundation or underscore, I can say, for our work, or, or jumping board, I can also say ground and jumping board, it's, uh, it's still present today. Now it's much more articulated because we know much more, we research much more, but it's there. It's there. And of course, it's, it's lots of things added. But is Matt Houston Jones? It's just there, you know. Stephanie Skura, who was my teacher, is mm -hmm. there. The Skinny Releasing is based. The Contact Improvisation. Nina Martin, Jennifer mm -hmm. Monson's work, um, Didi Dorvillier. Really you know, they they are in mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. our vocabulary, and we are building building now our work with their work from from there. And we can also see it with Peter that it's somehow present, but not really known. Not really. I have no, to say, we have work to do. It, <laughs> yeah, it was always so beautiful because, uh, of course, Peter was, uh, he was always there at all of the festivals, all of your, 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 uh, Contact Budapest, uh, festival. Uh, he was always there. And that's actually where I first met him also. And it's interesting because he's also, I mean, he's a very big guy and he's 
German and he has this commanding presence and he is just, I mean, he's amazing also in his uh, way of just being himself. And what was always really lovely for me to see is, is how there was such an, um, such a clear, uh, trust and commitment and just, uh, like, your collaboration, your friendship, your support for each other, it was, it was like so unquestionable. Yeah. So I feel like it, 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 if, if there ever was a true collaborator, um, it, it would feel like karmically or, or whatever, you know, you guys found each other. And, and to me, it's so clear that you're going to continue working together on different levels. And yeah. Um, but it's it's really beautiful to see. It's really beautiful to see two people who are so much their own. Also, I think that makes it really wonderful. He is his own, his you know his own teacher. His he has his own company. He's he's done his own work, and you have done your own work. But you keep on inter interweaving and supporting each other. Uh, and it's beautiful to see. It's really beautiful to see. And I'm really happy to also see, and I've spoken to him about that, that, um, you know, that when he turned 50, I think he said, so, okay, now, <laughs> like, I think he said, okay, I've done a lot of things, but now is the time to really get my choreography out. And it was so lovely to see that, yeah. to, to say, and he did that. I mean, he really, and that was even before he started uh, uh, Cranky Bodies, is he, he, you know, he got funding, he got into some big theaters. And just because on, on another level, and this is uh, the second part to this, and on another level, I feel like dance suffers in a lot of ways with this obsession about youth or we're just, you know, because we are, we're in this physical body and it's a physical art form in so many ways it is focused on the young bodies and i can understand that because on a technical level we need certain abilities but on a maturity level most artists they really start kicking ass in their 40s 50s 60s writers musicians architects you know that's when we start to really get to know our work you know having invested so many years so when he started doing that, I was like, oh, yeah, I think that's awesome. I think it's really important. But also when you're young, you know, you don't you don't you don't get it. You don't understand, you know, what it is about age. But I love seeing Eva Kortsov, Simone Forty, um, Steve Paxton moving, you know, Lisa Nelson performing with Steve. When Nancy, Nancy, it was Nancy. amazing. Ama so, yeah. And now when you're, you know, in your 50s, <laughs> then you start understanding. And now I'm like, you know, I'm. Mostly, you know, when I wake up, you know, Isma or who, who was the one? Maybe Peter Halton was asking. So when you wake up in the morning, how do you wake up? Are you a dancer? Are you a performer? Are you a teacher? Whatever. So most of the time I wake up, I, I have been waking up in terms of my job. I'm a teacher. You know, I'm teaching. I'm teaching. I'm teaching a lot of teaching. But then I'm a, I had to identify myself as a dancer but I'm not working as a dancer, you know, and for many reasons. And now it's a big change because I'm going to, I'm dancing, I'm dancing. I was asked by a young choreographer four years ago in Hungary, dance in his project. I was like, why do you ask me to dance in your project? And I don't know, he was just like, you know, he got it. And then it was a lot of research, tiny research, finding small movements, perfect. And after that, I felt like, oh yeah, the dancing. Of course, I created my own work and then I did it. I stopped it. Um, about 10 years ago, but because I had to make choices, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't do like six or seven or eight different things. So I, in that sense, you know, creating my own work and dancing uh, was like less and less and less. But I haven't really danced for others except after Arnhem. And then he asked me, and then there was another choreographer asking me, and there was another one. So I was like, okay, okay. How do how to be in a rehearsal when I'm a dancer? You know, it's like, you know, because I, I, I did that such a long time ago. And they were beautiful processes, and and now it's now again. I'm I'm going to be in in two projects as a dancer, as a performer, and also as a researcher. But but it's just fantastic. So I'm going to teach less, and I think that's really like, oh, but I have I have to do it. And I know that Ava Ava is real. I'm sorry to bring Ava so much, but she's always coming to me because she said, okay, I can come and teach. She's on a performance go. She's performing. She's creating. She's doing her legacy work, but she's making it into a performance. It's so beautiful what she does with um, 
Bettina Neuhaus, you know, really tracing mm -hmm. their, their lineage, their historical things. But it becomes a map and it becomes a dance performance, you know, with lecture and, and talking about their work and who they are connected and their peers and their teachers and they bring it into a dance performance. You know, I, I just love it. Mm -hmm. And so I think dancing is there and, yeah, I'm more... So what you're talking about is also making choices. This podcast is called good choices and to me it's so much about making good choices in uh, on many different levels you know like you said I make a choice if I wake up in the morning and I make a choice oh I'm a dancer or I'm a teacher or I'm I'm a woman or yeah or the small choices that we make you know where we even shift our focus I think so much of performing is also about making choices in terms of where's my focus right now or what part of my body is relating to my partner or what part of my body is projecting out I mean it's it's a constant choice making process that we're in um, on a very down-to-earth level, I would like to ask you, because um, I think we're also quite similar in that, um, that we're, we're busy bodies. We, we have many talents, many interests. You're also a mother of two children, um, as, as I am also. But you also, I mean, you live in Hungary, and it's not, I would say, not the best uh, time to be an artist in terms of funding, to in terms of um, uh, uh, political climate, to be an artist. How do you manage? How, I mean, it's, it's a twofold question. So on the one hand, how, how do you manage making uh, or finding priorities in the many things that you do, teaching, performing, um, organizing um, and and uh, balancing that with your daily life, with your children, with your family, um, and at the same time also balancing it with simply making money. I think that's such a big topic for so many dancers. Um, and then on top of it, living in Hungary in such a such a restrictive time. How do you manage mm. that? Wow, that's such a uh, layered and and complex uh, issue. Uh, because I think the generally the the atmosphere, how I sense in my country, is is not so pleasant. Like um, I don't feel so um, comfortable in in many situations um, when it when it comes to you know where this country goes and where the leaders of the country are bringing bringing this nation and i really don't i just don't agree and and there are lots of things of of that it's really out of my um how would i say uh, for for some reason i made the choice to move back to hungary when i left holland after being there for almost 10 years and i made the choice because I was deeply connected to the dance, the dance scene. And from the moment on I studied outside of my country, I was coming back and sharing that work. Starting organizing was about whatever I experienced outside of this country, I want to bring it here. I want to bring teachers that I studied with and I want to share with this community. And I put so much effort and so much energy and there was one moment when I had the feeling that I just, it's, I cannot burn myself out. It's just, I can't, I can't do more if I don't take care of myself. So I started to focus more on myself and I had to let go of organizing big events. After like maybe 16 years, I was organizing not just East Sides, but festivals and other things. And also seeing that there would be not enough recognition and value given in terms of um, also offering financial support for, for this field, like mm. supporting through applications a festival or, a, or my project or other people's projects to be paid as a dancer. So I made the choice of, of living on teaching. And, yeah. uh, Can I just and, and interject for, for, for one moment? Because I think uh, 
you might have suffered from not getting the recognition on on the Hungarian sort of institution or funding level. But I do have to say that, I mean, you have my fullest respect. And I know that from many, many of my colleagues and many of them were your teachers. Yeah, your heroes. I mean, Nita and Sarah, Nita Little and Sarah Shelton Mann and Nancy Stark Smith. And I mean, you brought in so many fabulous teachers. Yeah, so many of the founders of contact improvisation, so many of the people that were so highly and not just contact in general about uh, contemporary dance improvisation. I mean, some of the people that I still work with, I met at your festival. Yeah. And, and you produced in all the festivals that I've been all over Europe so far, and there've been quite many, you have produced one of the finest festivals that I've ever went to because you also managed to really balance, uh, you always, we, you always made these amazing performances. I don't know how you did that, but you had amazing musicians and you had this amazing clarity that this was not going to be just, uh, 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 a festival about teaching and studying, but it was always also about this performance quality or that that what we were doing, what we were studying or what we were teaching, in my case also, was always about applying it to performing. Yeah. And at the same time, what you were talking about, like who is a dancer was already included in that. So yeah. Tanzania was also performing and everybody was performing, you know, the teachers were performing, but the students were performing. And you managed that on such a high quality level that I just want to really say, you know, you, you did an amazing job for 15 years. That is such a long time. Yeah. But what, what is, what is important, uh, I think about, uh, you know, what I did in, in Hungary is that I could do it because I was in Arnhem, I had all the international connections and when I was in Arnhem living after school, I started, I went to my first East site in 98 and that's when I started to travel and teach in the, in the US, teach in Europe and teach in Russia and that's how I met, made connections and met lots and lots of people and that stayed being internationally um, you know, connected and, and having the uh, ability to travel, even if I was working mainly in my country, that was really important. And also I worked in an international project, which was about dance documentation, which is IDOC-D, and then the LEAP and the Reflex Europe, was also an international team being a project coordinator. So that, that was financially, that's also how I could live. Like it's, uh, my, my income was not only for my country, but being in this international scene and having the possibility. So I think this is, this is really major and that I could do that. And, uh, and also keeping the international relationship, like with you, you know, we was like, and then I went to Austria, but you come here and then I was teaching here, but then you invited me. So this was the exchange. And this is not about one country or another country, but it's a, it's different kind of communities that going over the boundaries, over the border boundaries, mm -hmm. but over the borders of the countries. Mm -hmm. I think that kept me strong inside of myself and saying, okay, I live in this country, I live in Hungary, but I have the possibility that I can reach out and I can exchange. And I think mm -hmm. that through that I could bring also, um, sources or, 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 or information to those who could not travel that much. And then I think that's, that's where I see also um, that it's very, very important how I could, I'm not, I don't like the word survive because I'm not surviving, you know, I'm, I'm living, I'm processing things. There were moments when I felt I want to leave the country, but I have two kids and they are, you know, I have a Hungarian partner and then we live here and then I don't, I don't want to take them. And also, there's so many other issues why you make choices of staying here or leaving a country or whatever. So um, I just made the choice to stay here, but I think it's important that I have these international uh, connections. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think uh, if we talk about, you know, what was the feeling in the country, and we also talk about improvisation, and we talk about choices. I, th I just created a work now. We had the premiere on the 30th of November with the mixed ability company, Tanzania. And I felt the way I was working with improvisation with the company was really political. 
Like, I never thought about that my work is political <laughs> until I started to think about it. And the way we were working that, uh, and the structure we created and the way we were there, I just felt like it's, it's really a political thing that we go on stage and then we do improvisation with mixed ability. Like, yes, a person in a wheelchair is able to make decisions on, on his <laughs> own right, even if I'm, I need to move his chair in order to change place and location. But we create something together. And, um, and, and, and I think this is what I can do. You know, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm not a politician. I don't know so much about it. I can't really deal with it. Lots of, dance is not changing the world. Dance, but I make a performance. I make an improvised performance. And then I can talk to the audience. So it was very strange. I've never done that. But after the show, I was like, there was the... The applause, and then it's like, okay, sorry, I have to tell you what we did. And it was quite funny, because I never do that. There was no program. You know, they could read a little bit about the poem that I wrote about the, the piece. And then I just, yeah, I just shared them. I just shared them the structure. That what we did, we really didn't know. And then we created this evening. And then there were three different ways we were dealing with presence, with connections, with energy, with space and ensemble and individuals. And I think this is really important. And I think that is a statement. And I think being an improviser and bringing God on stage, I want to do it because I think that's really important. And also what is important about improvisation, that you have to work really hard. You re not really hard, not hard, I don't like the word hard, but you really have to work and you really have to dig in order to really be there in the moment and not know, because you know a lot. So it's, it's also like another, it, it's, it's, it's a big thing to, to talk about, and words are really, can be a trap, you know, when we use, because I don't work hard, I don't want to work hard anymore. <laughs> I really work from, yeah. from, from, from like, from my jiget, from my guts and from my heart, uh, but, but it's a constant, it's constant work, and you have to, you have to be interested and you have to dig and then you are, there is something cooking and it's like, mm, I'm going to go out there so people are going to see me and I can have an exchange. Performing is mm. an exchange. And, mm. and I really believe in that, that there is something happening to me and then when people are there with me, something is happening and that's what I can, mm. that's what I can do. And I think teaching ourselves about readiness readiness and, and recognizing things and really act how you need to act. I think this is today because yeah. this pandemic with, uh, with not having running water because something happens out there, uh, you know, it's, a, it's really, really important. And the body. Yeah. Which, which body. ties it together with me also with, with uh, parenthood, you know, I mean, <laughs> parenthood is so much about uh, improvising and being ready and being present to what is at the moment. Uh, as well as balancing the different interests or balancing the different uh, tasks that need to be done. Yeah. Um, since uh, we don't have so much time left, but I think uh, I, I I think it's beautiful to hear how um, how your dancer, like your dancer self, your performer self, is interacting. Like you're interacting on. On, um, on a human level, living in Hungary, you're interacting on a, um, on a, uh, like a, you said the word survival, but it's not about surviving, but it's, it's still, I mean, the economic situation of being a dancer is a fact. I mean, there's <laughs> very, very few of us who make really big, have really big incomes. And so sort of the, the daily realities of, you know, also having a family or also dancing for a longer period of time. I mean, I feel like sustaining ourselves as dancers is such a big topic, both on a physical, but also on an emotional level. And you were talking about, you know, deciding uh, to step away from organizing these big events because it was simply too much or it was you know, yeah. is uh, to burning out. And I think that's really also something that we need to talk about within our community. So one aspect that I, I would like to bring up at the end is, is that Contact Improvisation is celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. And uh, since both of us have been involved in it for such a long time, um, 
from different perspectives, but but still we are both we both come from a contemporary point of view and we were both professional dancers entering contact and we're both teaching it we're both uh, performing we're both organizing around it so i think we have a multi-layered perspective on on the form and also on the community what do you think um in those in the time that you have been involved in how do you think has the form changed and what do you think uh what do you think is its shadow what is like there's obviously there's some very wonderful things about it but there's also in everything that we do there's also a shadow and how would you how would you share that also with teachers or with uh dancers how can we um kind of um become i think become aware of the shadow and how can we also i mean that as you esther and as me sabine that's really a question for me also how can how can we speak about the form that it's also um that it also has not just a glorifying uh, aspect which it obviously does because we love it and we work with it but um how what would you consider it um what is the gift for you in the, in the form of contact improvisation but what is maybe also a shadow aspect of it Mm. Yeah, it's been a long time that actually I think about it. I mean, I, or, or I thought about it. Sorry for my English. Um, and I remember Eastsides when we talked about the shadow side of contact. And when you were speaking about bringing this, the, the shadow side, I could, I saw an image, uh, basically this image. So if I do that, you know, so there is a light coming in and there's a shadow on the back wall. And if I do that, you know, the light is here and the shadow is there. So they are not oppositional. They are not, you know, biased. They are, they are complementary. They are, they are both, they are both there. You know, I think if the light is coming, there is shadow. But I think that's what's beautiful, that it's actually bringing us into places to continue researching, continue dialoguing. And what a shadow is everything can become a shadow in contact you know it could be the the way the, the way we deal with the, the deal with touch if i teach if i teach it in um in a university and and then i started to like center to center dancing and and then suddenly it's like male female together or male male they're like you know if there's too much weight or if there is like um uh, there's such an intimacy that then they that they cannot deal with that and then they don't know why they do it and then they think that it's really harming them and then so it's like that can, something which is really beautiful a center to center dance becomes a sh shadow in terms of their reading if it's an oppositional you know and if I don't look at it then it's like okay so what is the issue here what does it bring up you know what what kind of how can I focus on the essences and my intention to to bring for those people who come into practice I, I i didn't use the word teach because it's an intention what i what i'm bringing for those people to discover for themselves so language yeah. is really difficult but language is really important how we actually communicate that and it's interesting that i have not been thinking so much about the shadow side of contact because because I'm I'm in this, I'm researching contact improvisation now in in, in, in my in, I'm I'm writing my PhD, but I'm more in um, in in my own pedagogical work. You know what I developed through an institution through institutions, which is dance um, colleges and uh, now at the University of Theatre and Film Arts. So it's like what I teach for actors uh, about contact and why I do it and how I apply it and so on. And the legacy, I'm researching the legacy of contact in my country, in Hungary. And I'm really coming into details and I'm reading about a lot of details about, about contact and how much, how much we know. And, and also bringing the, the, the bias, the, 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 the right or, or the wrong or the yes or the no, um, merging, merging and mixing and really looking at from different, from different perspectives. I think when, when we, um, when we, work like with the separation it's important also because then we have a recognition of like okay 
So here is a viewpoint, like for instance, the really bringing the, like uh, not taking care of the essentials or what's the, I don't know, like the, what's beneath, what, what's, what's, the, what's the source of, of the research, not taking care of that, but using the form for other things and naming contact, I think. Mm. But then it's again language. One, one little partner work can be done in so many ways, in so many ways. And I think... So you mean using contact improvisation, calling it contact improvisation, but actually working on, I don't know, nonviolent communication or community work or um, no, uh, more, therapeutic more work or... Yeah, a little bit therapeutic work, but not only that, but maybe maybe um, bringing it into, um, you know, calling body work, <laughs> contact improvisation, mm -hmm. or when 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 the essence is not, it's on touch maybe, but not on the dancing, you know, not researching the physical laws on on two bodies meeting, uh, or or bringing it into an extreme sexual setups. That not mm. sensual, but sexual, mm. you know, when it, when it becomes, but again, like somebody's developing it, naming it somehow, then name it, name it that way. What do you do with it? I think we can do lots of things with contact improvisation, but when we call it contact, I think we have to keep on conversating. We have to define again and again and again, because that's how we're going to go further and then say that, oh, I think this is, hmm, and this is, hmm. I think this, this yeah. dialogue is just going to continue because nobody told us so that if this I, is, is. Yeah, so if I sum it up, maybe in a way, I think what I'm hearing is, is that there are many, um, because it's such an open form, I often describe it as being very water-like and water can be, you know, it can be uh, a big waterfall or it can be a silent pond or a quiet pond or it can be one water drop. So the quality of water in and of itself can have many different forms um, and it's hard to hold on to it. It's hard to actually grasp it, what it is, but it's obviously there. So in a lot of ways, I feel like contact is, is very much like water It is when when we're in it, when we feel like it has a clear intention, we also can feel kind of the clarity of that of that water. But when we add some some color to it or we add some taste to it, that it will shift also in that way. And so what I'm hearing from you is maybe that uh, that is also its shadow because it's such an open form. It can also be used in so many different ways. And so let's just call it something different and say, OK, we might use some elements of contact improvisation in order to explore some tantric work or to explore some therapeutic work or to explore some community community work. But at the core of it, the practice, the core practice is something in it of itself. And I think that is really good to know where it comes from. And I think that's what's missing in many contact festivals or in many contact uh uh, events lately that I feel like, you know, where's the line between boogie dancing and, and contact or barefoot dancing, you know, like, where's the line between just turning on some music and, and just rubbing against each other? Yeah, that, that oftentimes there is something from from the core principles that are still missing like have you ever taken a class like sometimes i want to go up to a jam and ask people have you ever taken a contact improvisation class and it doesn't mean that i want to exclude people I, it doesn't mean that i want to say you can't be at the jam but the question is really like do you do you know that there is a technique behind this do you know that there is a really long-standing form behind this do you know that there is a history yeah. behind this would you yes. agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, in terms of how I'm thinking about about this uh, this issue that we are we are now bringing bringing and talking about, um, I think that's a big, huge challenge of the work. It could be named as shadows, shadows of contact, but I think it's a big challenge, and that's what our job is to keep on articulating and keep on asking questions and keep on saying, okay. I think three essential things at least. One is the small dance. The small dance is essential. And I'm using the small dance as a thinking like the inner quiet 
or the inner calm or quiet or the inner listening of the small dance. Okay, we also do somatic work. Okay, somatic approach. Small dance. When I'm do teaching phrases, I'm not teaching contact, but I'm referring to it because I do small dance with them. That's one thing. Like behind the big lifts, there is a small dance. That's one about contact. The other thing is really where do I place my focus? And my focus is if I'm touching my partner, my partner becomes my environment. It's part of my environment. And the third thing is if that person becomes my environment and I'm researching the physical laws on my body, I'm also in the mode of responding. I'm always responding. I'm placing myself like as a, yeah, I'm, it's, it's a solo. It's my experience, but it's a response. It's my environment that is changing and my partner becomes my environment through my touch and it's responsive. So my, if I use the terminology from phenomenology, it's responsive phenomenology on that line, you know, that it's not the singular, it's not me who is in the center of the research, but it's already a response to something, me as a response. And that's what I can explore and experience through contact physically and understand through my physical self with my whole self so I can bring it to the world. And then what I do with it, I can do boogie, but when I do contact, and, and, and I, can, I can be informed by contact and my boogie will change. I mean, that's what the big thing was about the festival I was organizing. It was called Improvisation Festival. But contact and, and the way we were looking at the body and the way we were working with the physical self was really, and the whole improvisation that was, that was out there was also resourced. And the main ground was also like there is contact improvisation, just like Ismail or not just Nita, but Nina Martin. It's like the way of thinking about improvisation and the improvisation mind is somehow was underlined with also the thoughtfulness and the thinking and the research of the emerging form of contact improvisation. Woohoo! you just put it all together. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> what a lovely way to, to um, really bring it together at the end. Yeah. Well, um, Esther, it's been wonderful talking to you. I, I love you. I, it's wonderful <laughs> to you. see you. We don't get to see each other so much right now, but I look forward to more, yeah. more research, Thank more you. dancing, Thank more you. improvising Fabulous. together. Thank you. Mm. Yes. Thank you, you have, so much. You have to dance together, some contact. <laughs> oh, for sure. I I need some more performing time. I think I think you inspire me to get up in the morning and say I am a dancer. Um, I will do that <laughs> right away. Okay. Yes. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah, Take you. care. Bye bye. bye. Ciao. Yeah. Yeah. If you would like to know more about Holistic Dance and the Holistic Dance Institute, please visit us at our website www.holistic-dance.at. Holistic Dance is an invitation to transformation through dance, movement and touch. It was founded by me, Sabine Parzer, in 2010. It is a mix of different methods, a dynamic cross-method approach from dance pedagogical, dance and body therapeutic, systemic and holistic methods. We offer authentic movement, integrative contact improvisation, somatics and applied anatomy, improvisation, ecosomatics and many more elements. I offer holistic dance workshops, I offer single sessions, I offer teachers trainings, embodiment trainings, advanced teachers tracks, year groups and retreats. I would be very happy to see you at one of our events. And if you have any questions, please write me an email.